welcome to this Academy Lecture from Berlin in 2018. Uh, our guest on the couch today used to sit on that side of the room where all of you are as a participant normally of the Academy. Normally there. I would normally sit there. Yeah. Sitting up yeah. at the back. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but now she's on this side of the room today um, as our lecture host guest. Uh, please help me welcome Nina Kravitz. Could I please have the first photograph on the screen? Oh, that's me. <laughs> that's you. Marco. That's you at the Academy in 2006. Patrick. There's also all my peers there. Uh, I remember them all, actually. Each, each, each person was quite special. person from Hong Kong, from Australia, from Canada, Chile. Brian, and who else? Yeah, everybody is there, actually. Even Wally Badaru, the keyboard player on Grace Jones Records, is right there behind a lady in a red T-shirt. Do you remember how you felt when you were at the Academy? Uh, yes, I do. Um, at first, I felt really nervous. It was such a big thing for me. Um, I didn't know how to behave. Everything was just so overwhelming. Also, um, maybe you know, but it wasn't uh, that easy for me to actually go to the academy. What happened? Because I was refused with a visa uh, in the first year, where I actually uh, was chosen to be a participant in 2005, and I was supposed to be Seattle. But like a lot of things in my life happen, everything just uh, happened exactly the way it supposed to happen and um, I was the 31st, the only probably 31st participant in the whole history of this academy because um, I was just so upset of not at, um, being able to attend the 2005 one in Seattle that Rebel was really kind to allow me to, you know, to be a participant in Australia. So this whole thing was really overwhelming, but um, I think on the second week, I really got it, you know, I was just really comfortable and I realized what a special moment I'm actually having, experiencing, and everything was just um, incredible. This routine of listening to the music, um, visiting lectures, having an amazing lunch, <laughs> which is very important, you know. Then, um, going out and being able to do your own radio show, for example, have your own gig in Australia, you know, where people don't know who you are. But the most important thing was, of course, to um, have some time with other people at the academy, with other uh, scholars. And that was also one of the most special moments about this whole experience. We learn so much from each other and we have shared so many things. And with some of them, we still keep in touch and then this friendship would probably still go on. Um, and with some people, I even recorded music afterwards. Some people just became my really close friends. And um, yeah, I think it was just the turning moment for me. That was the first time when I realized that it's not only the hobby, what I'm doing, but it, I just saw that something that I'm doing is kind of looking like it actually exists. <laughs> and um, there was also a lot of moments when we would listen to the music and um, share the music, record the music get drunk together and, you know, the next morning, I guess, fantastic memories, actually. Yeah, and also um, I gave some demos at Red Bull Music Academy and one of my first, actually the first ever vinyl record <clears throat> with my work on it was released um, by Greg Wilson uh, that received the demo for this record of me and the band, My Space Rocket, exactly during the Academy. So it gave you a confidence to actually think this could be 
your daily work and not just something that you enjoy just for the pleasure of it? <laughs> it's actually a really funny story about it. Um, I, once we went um, just to jam a little bit in the studio with Shed Amir and uh, other participants. I think someone was drumming and, I, I, and, and Shed and me was singing. I mean, you have no idea um, what it was to me because uh, I was just like next to a legend. I would buy his records, play his records. Imagine like how I would meet him maybe one time and here we go, he's in, my, in the studio with me. We're singing some uh, melodies. I create text, he just picks up on it and then the other way around. And then he just told me, Nina, I actually think that you're much more confident with your shoes on. So could you please just take your shoes, put them on, and just like, let's continue singing. So yeah, it brought me some confidence through share and some shoes, for sure. <laughs> when you went to the Academy in Melbourne, you probably had to take quite a long flight to get there. Can you tell us a little bit about the part of the world that you're from? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm from Russia. This is this big country on the map, and pretty much in the center of it. It's and actually the biggest. Yeah, it is. Um, and it is, it takes quite um, some time to get to Australia. But if you think about it, actually, if you take just um, a flight from um, the western side of our of my country to the very eastern side of my country it's kind of it's almost uh, almost the same experience because <laughs> it has 11 if i'm not mistaken time zones it's it takes a lot of hours in the plane to get from let's say from murmansk or to vladivostok which is closer to japan china than to to europe and yeah, but it took me a long way, and I made my stop in Japan that time. Um, I kind of used everything that I could with this opportunity. And then I arrived in Australia, Russian, in, in Australia, yeah. <laughs> now, Russia is an extremely big place. It's vast and immense, so it can be quite hard to get a grip on where exactly you are in Russia. Can you tell us more about exactly where you're from in Siberia and what that kind of landscape is like, what it's like there? Um, well, I don't I want to sound arrogant or something, but um, I probably would because I think I'm coming from a very, very special place. I was born in, um, in, in the city that is called Irkutsk, um, but it is not the city that makes this place so special, but what is next to it, and that's the deepest lake in the world, which is called Baikal. It also contains, I think, 22% of all fresh water in the world. So if one day there will be not a single drop left to drink and to survive, you can all come to the place where I'm born. <laughs> and get as much water as you need, and you will be all right for eight years, the whole, the whole world. So it's pretty amazing, I think. But more than that, I appreciate the very specific and very special energy that this place um, has. And I have, a, I have a tradition to come back there to charge my batteries every year. And I just did it. I, I came back uh, a few weeks ago. How is it like? It's it's beautiful. It's very strong. You're just there, and you feel very different. You don't even know why. It's just very strange atmosphere right there. It's very um, specific and outstanding landscape with um, many different types of nature, you know, coming together in one picture. It's also b beautiful um, blue water and the freshwater lake that actually seems like a sea, like a real sea, where you can sail with dangerous waves and very, very cold water that you just can't even stand more than two minutes. 
And we also have um, uh, we also have a seal in the freshwater lake, the only seal in the world that lives in a freshwater lake. Is he all by himself? <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> it's not like he's the only one seal living in the whole lake. It's uh, actually a few of them, but just like this spe very specific type of the seal called Njerpa, and it's a super pretty animal. I, I, I dream to, to actually one time go and just witness how they live, but they're really, um, they're private. They don't like humans, because humans hunt them and for the furs and... Speaking of maybe being on your own, I'm glad he's not. Um, what, how would you describe the Siberian character? Do you feel that where you're from has an impact on who you feel you grew up as? Um, I think I'm a representation of a Siberian, to be honest. If there is anything, any, any representation of us, it's definitely, I, I own everything from it. You know, it's, it's bloody cold in, in the place where I'm from. <laughs> like, sometimes you don't go out because it's just minus 35 or 40. And as a scholar, it's amazing because you can stay home and listen to the music and don't go to school. But, I mean, you have a very short summer and we don't really have um, spring or that longer autumn. We just have, like, either hot weather or really, really cold weather. Hot, cold and dry weather. It's uh, an intense um, climate, and it's an extracontinental climate, we call it, and nothing really grows there that much, so you need to use this, you know, two, three months of warm weather to actually grow some vegetables or, I don't know, berries, and to keep them for, for later, so you can eat them during, during winter when it's really cold and dark and everything. But, um, I, I, I really like it, uh, how it is there. I actually sometimes miss real winter, really hot summer sometimes. I, I like this change. And I think my character is exactly like this. I'm very impulsive, uh, very direct. Yeah, I, I can't hold any emotions too long. Um, I'm very much the person of the moment. I really appreciate the now. And I don't really much care about yesterday and tomorrow because no one knows what's going to happen tomorrow so too much thinking about tomorrow is also not really necessary so you know I just I'm yeah I'm kind of I think I'm sincere in when I'm in how I operate in life and yeah I just I think Siberian people maybe because of the weather conditions or something they just don't take any bullshit Normally, they just like, tell you what what they think, or or that there is a special fresh call hold for any for anything for any patients, and then when, once it's you know once it's over it, then the real Siberian um, awakens. Yeah, the city that you're from is nicknamed the Paris of Siberia because. A lot of creative people were exiled there during Russian history. Yeah. What, can you tell me about what makes this place so creative and what it was like to grow up there? <clears throat> um, I don't even know if I can ca call this place creative um, because I don't, I don't have really have a that of a great as overview of what has been happening there in terms of music or literature in. In like now, yeah. But we had uh, pretty amazing writers, like world and at least uh, very well known in Russia. We also have some fam famous musicians, like maybe the contemporary one would be the famous pianist Denis Matsuev, is from my city as well. Um, some opera singers, um, some DJs, uh, then some actors, and of course. Um, but we don't. We didn't really have, um, unfortunately, um, musical scene like electronic musical scene. There was not really much infrastructure for it. Though we had amazing clubs, like small little places, where creative people would gather and have some good time. And I was one of them. 
but it was really small and unfortunately just because of how far is it it, it is from any anywhere and even we have a lot of universities a lot of young people um, but still the club clubbing infrastructure isn't that developed unfortunately but what makes it creative I think um, the lack of of something these restrictions they always boost some creativity in people maybe um, it happened this way when we are talking about decabrists. The pe people were um, sent to Siberia centuries ago from Tsar because they were like not happy about some things, and were writing um, pretty uh, direct literature or poetry, you know, signalizing what's happening. So of course the government didn't really like it, so they sent them to the most far away remote place, which was my city and they built some nice houses there. They actually, I think they were doing pretty good there. They, they found their balance there. There were so many, so they had some friends, you know, their own, I, I think they were doing quite well, definitely. So creative individuals are kind of woven into the place that you're mm. from. But when it comes to me, I, I don't know, I just heard uh, um, a very interesting tune on the radio one time and I was playing with frequencies, with radio receiver. It was my hobby. I, had, uh, I was actually I had a luxury situation because I had my own room and I had my own sound system that my father uh, allowed me to have because my father is a very, uh, very um, passionate uh, fan, musical fan. And I was growing up surrounded by people that completely cannot imagine any single day of their life without listening to some music, which was actually really nice. Now, looking at it, um, I could say that my father has been having incredible taste in music, and I'm so thankful and grateful to have him, you know, because all my love, I think, for music came from him, that's for sure. It's like, it's, it's, I guess, genetic or, or something. Um, what kind of records would he play in the house in the sound system for you? Um, that would be a range, for sure. That would be... Um, it was not, we were not really about something like pop music or rock music. It was everything. You know, it would be like Gershwin, and then next day it would be Grace Jones. Next day it would be some uh, weather report, some kind of um, uh, jazz music, but this kind of more um, fusion jazz type, you know or some classic stuff, uh, and then there will be um, the music that I would start listening to, which were a little, not always like the, the just the most like good taste music sometimes, but I would listen to that too. But yeah, I mean, at the age of maybe six, seven, I could totally sing Borgi and Bass, for example, or like some Led Zeppelin parts without understanding what they mean. You know, I could just imagine like a six-year-old Siberian girl running about singing Led Zeppelin. Yeah, <laughs> like uh, about I'm gonna be your backdoor man or something without even understanding what's going on. But uh, yeah, so this was my music, or uh, let's say um, even Pink Floyd. That was my one of my favorite music, and it still is. Um, it was just, and I also was. I didn't really have many friends who were sharing my interests. So I was always a little isolated, actually. And um, my school experiences, they were uh, rather... Um, um, very eventful, yeah, I would say. And sometimes things w w would go a little... How would I say that? A little wrong. <laughs> Yes, and some, you know, at a certain age, I, I guess everyone in this room knows that the most cruel people and are probably kids and, you know, those, uh, how you say it, Padrostki, um, um, like when you cross from the kid to... A teenager? A, a, a teenager, yes. So like teenagers are really, really terrible people sometimes. And... Um, especially these young, younger ones. They can be really cruel, brutal, nasty, you know, aggressive. 
And uh, since I was not never really this kind of gregarious girl, and I was never really belonging to any band, <laughs> I don't know, um, team, you know, I, I don't know. It's just since since then, it's still now the same thing. I don't know why, but I just never really fit in any team. Kind of, I'm always a little mm, by myself. I don't know why. And some people didn't really like it. And, also didn't like what I say sometimes, didn't like that I didn't want to be in the team and I didn't recognize uh, the team rules as the most crucial rules of my life, you know. And then I had some different interests and then I, was, I had a lot of temperament, so they, would, they were really cruel to me, so I had to spend a lot of time like really uh, like fighting and defending myself from all this kind of stuff. So... Um, in, in a way, this music, I think, it was some kind of a escape in a very good way, where I felt maximum free, you know, maximum myself, without any pressure, where my mind could go whatever, whenever it wants. And I think, also looking at it, from, at it now, I realized that some things that I would dream of that time, as a little girl or as a teenager, teenager that they would they would be a reality now they would become a reality later which is which sounds almost unbelievable but yeah i would imagine sometimes of performing or singing um or playing music to a large amount of people when i was not even thinking of becoming one and now look i actually do this for my living and uh, my biggest let's say the hobby or thing that I wanted to do became my profession. So I think this is a really important point on dreaming. Sometimes dreaming can be very, very um, um, useful <laughs> in life. So yeah, I think I just feel really good to listen to the music. And once I've, I, I heard this acidic track that I never, like this kind of this type of music that I never even heard before, which was Armando as a track on the radio. And also I found it very captivating, you know, to listen to the, the show because we had five hours difference in between Moscow and Irkutsk. So my, my parents would go to bed, I would go back to my room, I will pretend that I'm sleeping. Turn on my radio and look at all those little lights, you know, that would be sparkling from the darkness. And I had this national, it's called national uh, tape recorder and radio receiver, so you could also have some AM frequencies, you can have FM frequencies, this little round thing, you can tune and then you can just like for bypass some interesting radio stations on like with crazy languages that I don't even know and sometimes the wave, you know, it will just get stuck somewhere for some orange juice that I put on, on the tape or on the recording before or something and you would just be like stuck in some really weird zone and they would, you would see, you would hear the wave, you know, from China for example, like, eh, and then the other wave like coming from Iran or from something, it's like, uh, it's mental, super mental. And I would always remember that effect and I would use that in music later on. And that was so good, you know, I could spend all, all nights uh, doing that. And also I never really slept uh, during the night since I was a kid. So my profession right now, it's totally fitting me. That's it's like, I like it. And yeah, so, and then I got completely I was I was hooked on on this acid line and on this electronic music and I would record every radio show that would be transmitted on Friday and Saturday called Garage. Доброй ночи, вы слушаете радиостанцию Европа Плюс, радио программу Гараж. Я с вами Олег Сухов. Будем слушать два часа замечательную электронную музыку. I would record everything and the next morning would be like grooving to it, listening to it from from a cassette. That's how everything started. Since then, hooked. Didn't leave me for one single day, this music. And especially that amazing music, that acidic side of it. We'll talk about it later if you want. Mm -hmm. yeah, still, this, nice. this journey still goes. And every day something new is 
you know, popping up that I have never seen before, I've never heard about, opening me like a whole new world, whole new era, whole new stuff. Like, I don't know, how is this even possible? But somehow it is possible, and I'm very happy about it. When we're in Berlin right now, one of the homes of electronic music, and the story of how electronic music started here is very familiar. Um, how did this music travel to you in Siberia through the radio? Was it, did you ever go to raves? Were you ever allowed to go to raves? I'd love to know the journey that this music took from places like Berlin all the way to you. Well, this is another interesting uh, side of this of my story because I actually never visited any rave until I was maybe 18 or something like that. I was at home, and my because I told you I had some situations. I I, I once visited a discotheque in Siberia, and I was that. I mean, that was that was. Um, uh, I mean, that was really uh, bad because um, it wasn't it wasn't a nice nice um, uh, experience. So after that, my um, my parents decided that this was the last time I'm actually out at uh, at in the evening. And um, I again. Think, talking about it, I'm thinking about this concept of mi limitations in life, restrictions. That sometimes people have all this access to raves, to the best record collection, to the record stores, to um, limitless uh, amounts of uh, music, but they don't have interest to it because they take it for granted. You know, and just like for me, that was everything. And the interesting point is, after I, list, I heard for the first time the acid track on the radio, I wanted to know more about it. I was only like beginning of um, internet era, and I was still a teenager. And I wanted to have my radio program, and I actually, I did make it happen. I became a radio presenter in, on Radio Peak, and my program was called Positron. I, just don't, I don't know why it was... Come, this term is coming from physics. I just found it really nice word, word play, you know, to talk about something nice and positive and also return to some physics that I didn't really learn that well in school. So, yes, and but I didn't really have access to music. I only had some pirate, uh, you know, recordings or um, actually also one of the reasons why I got, uh, I went to the, uh, work on the, on the radio was that they had some libraries, some really cool CDs, you know, and um, actually at least some source of music where I could go and listen. So it would sound really weird, but the first years I would imagine how it is to be on a rave. I would imagine what each of these DJs that were like the basis of Chicago or Detroit scene that I knew like so meticulously every name and every whatever catalog and I was so into it. But I would sometimes not have a chance to actually listen to the record because that time there were not uh, such thing as internet or file sharing something. It was only radio, only um, cassettes, um, some CDs and some magazines that I would trade for something from my friends that were, you know, bringing them from overseas or something like that. Like music record, uh, music, music uh, magazine. That was a really, I really miss this magazine actually. It was so good. And there was also absolutely um, amazing magazine in, uh, in, in, in Russia. Actually two of them. But first one, Ptuch, was... Um, I think even looking at how they managed, how cool they managed to make it, uh, I think it was really one of the best magazines that I've seen, actually. Now that I can compare and I could see other magazines and the artworks, you know, um, the editorials, um, the, the level of journalism and 
I think it was really one of the best uh, magazines. And I would read that as well. And I would dream that I one day I would go to Moscow. And of course, the other dream that I had, I went to my parents and I said, um, I, I need um, a passport for foreign um, visits. Uh, they said, why? I said, because I need to get an um, American visa. I said, why do you need to, make, uh, to get an American visa? I said, because I need to visit Detroit. And I need to go to Chicago and to um, meet Ray Barney or something like that, at least. And, well, I didn't go to U.S. until Red Bull Music Academy. And again, limitations, limitations and restrictions made me one of the most hungry for music person in the world, I think, because I just wanted to have my music next to me, you know, I, I, I would kill for anything that would be, but that would have something to do with the music that I like. And I think this passion and this kind of um, heritage of not having access to music and not having any um, uh, anything that any European person living in that golden era, mm. even though it, it it already kind of finished by the time I was I got interested to it because yeah the the, the best time I think already was past but <clears throat> the most intense one but um, I still got a little like drops of it and um, I think I'm still riding on this excessive hunger for information, for music, for everything. And I'm very thankful and I think it's really great that I'm coming from the city that didn't have all that, that it had such an enormous impact on me and grew this hungry record digger, you know. Let's talk about some of your own music. Let's talk about some of your early music. I think we should listen to something that you made in the early days. Um, I'm going to play a track for you that is called Pain in the Ass. And okay. it is one of your first records from 2009. And we can talk a little bit about how this record was made and the experiments in your early days that got you to where you are now. So this is a track of, a, a solo track of Nina's from 2009. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, actually, I'm just like sitting and yeah. Yeah, there's just lots of people. You can sit back. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Relax into this, it. Now I will sit a little bit facing you. Everyone gets their turn. <clears throat> um, so that came out in 2009. It was one of your first solo records and it came a couple years after you left the Academy. And I'm really curious about this period in time for you because you tried a bunch of different things out. You were in bands, you sang in groups, there was some rock music, some pop music. And I'd like to know a little bit more about that process and particularly about how you felt you could create yourself through trial and error. What kind of lessons did you learn in that time? Wow, that, uh, <laughs> that's a very um, good question. <laughs> but it requires some time to answer it. First of all, I, I don't think I ever planned anything. I was just doing things that made me feel happy and excited. And the only filter or the only way I, um, you know, I, I've chosen my opportunities or I've cho I decided what to do was simply asking this question, like, just like monitoring how I feel about it. And most of the things that I think of now um, is something truly unique or magical, you know, from that time, they happened really quick without me really thinking about it. And uh, until this present moment, this concept is probably 
the only concept that works in my life. Because I don't think um, that everything can be planned or structured or all these decisions, that, with these logical decisions that we make in our heads and are not always the right ones and not always the decisions that we crave for. But when I follow something that I uh, truly feel and I don't even know the reason why, I don't have a logical explanation of certain decision. And then just it just turns turns out to be one of the best things I did, or something like that. I mean, it not always happens this way. I have to say, some stuff are, um, you know, there's there's been some mistakes, of course, and everything. But um, I, I really respect my mistakes. I, I treasure treasure them because um, through through them you learn um, so many so many things and. It inspires you to do some more stuff or change your path, you know, from this trial and error method. In general, um, I think creative professions or artists, they do not function uh, following logical thinking. I think uh, as, as more as we grow uh, as a society, as human beings, we realize that the key for the right decision is only partly made in our brains, but it has to go close hand in hand with what you really feel or with your emotional side. And um, for example, this record, that record, um, Pain Yes, um, it was made as some certain joke. I actually, you're right, it, it, that was, maybe one of the most important records that I made. It was a part of uh, 12 inch. The other side was I'm gonna get you, which was a completely different type of music. More song structured, like more sounding like Italo disco or that kind of, or maybe some flirt sing singer, you know, from Bobby Orlando production or something like that. And this, I don't know, I, I, I remember now actually, that this track has something to do with Rebel Music Academy. Why? Because um, one time, after our academy was finished, uh, we still, we were friends with Daniel Brand, which, who was in my um, term as well, um, in the same year of academy. We became friends and we, we actually uh, collaborated a lot and we even performed together. So after we returned home, uh, we kept connection. And one time, I, I think I came to his home um, in Germany, and we were jamming in his studio, uh, in attempting to record something amazing. <laughs> I was singing, and that time I wasn't really, uh, I, didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. I was just like singing and enjoying the process of it. He was playing something, I was playing some stuff as well, some synthesizers. And then, I mean, long story short, the song with him didn't really work out. But I practically always say everything I do. I never throw stuff away, that's my um, absolute rule. Like, there's like two di different types of musicians. One type is you don't record, you don't press record until everything is perfect, until you know what to do, until you are really sure what you're gonna do in the next two minutes. I'm complete opposite. I just keep on enjoying, keep on playing, even with the machines that I don't really know much about and which I find a, a big advantage, you know, because you have this fresh, um, acute form of emotion of encountering something new that I haven't seen before. So it really stimulizes your brain and your whole existence, you know, to, for, for a new type of uh, communication with an instrument. And this is, I think, the most important or the most um, uh, cherished by me material that you can ever get, because it's this first contact experience. So. Whenever I try instruments or whatever I play, just even if I don't know completely what I'm gonna do, I always record everything. 
and wait until I make some interesting mistake or until something goes off. And then later you can re-edit stuff or you can just take something from your recording and make it um, a basis for the new song. This is exactly what happened with this song. When I returned to Moscow, I was just going through the recording. I was a little sad that we didn't really make anything. I, I kind of I made one version, but I didn't didn't like it. It was a little more a little too simple for me. And also that time I was recording music. Uh, I just left a band where I uh, spent maybe two years or something. We were even touring for one year. I was a front singer. It, 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 it um, we released one record on Greg Wilson label. In, and even Vakula was a part of this record. It was 2007. And, um, but things didn't really work out in between us and I had to leave uh, the band, also leaving all the songs that I wrote and all the music that we were writing together f you know, for all these years. So it was a little tragedy for me. And um, I, out of this stress and out of this little you know, drama, I. I think I also, I took a lot of inspiration, so the next day I broke up with a band, I just took the most simple equipment, uh, microphone, because that was my main thing that I could actually do, you know, and control quite well. And um, I, I um, bought a cork synthesizer, R3, my favorite, my favorite baby, because it's the first one, of course. Um, I just came to the store and said, I want a synthesizer, you know, like, all right, what kind of synthesizer? I don't know, I just want a synthesizer. And I was just trying them um, by ear, you know. I don't have any uh, musical education whatsoever. But I have a very sharp ears. I mean, I could mm, record or I could uh, tell the key or whatever. I could sing accurately every little detail. Um, so, and then I got a sound card uh, and a little drum machine and with this simple equipment I was just experimenting and I, didn't, I really didn't want anyone to know that I'm doing that and also I started DJing already, I was quite a, well, quite a known DJ in my own city, I was also doing parties for two years, working as a promoter, continuing uh, doing my dent dental part of life, you know, I was, I was working at the hospital during the day. So um, it was an intense life and um, again the music was like, you know, the escape from all of it. I felt the most comfortable with that, like myself, my true self. And um, You know, um, I was going through this project and started playing around with it. And you can hear in the beginning of the song Daniel's voice even from that studio recording. I think I told him what that one time, but he didn't really pay attention. So, and I took the, uh, um, the synth line that I, he had much more instruments than I did that time. So I just cut it and believe it or not, the rest of the, st of the song I made on, in my uh, kitchen, in my home, in my house, and I recorded all the vocals that you hear through the m microphone of laptop. And that's some lyrics inspired, let's say, co-inspired by um, Blade Runner, and some not, and that were, maybe you remember the line about kids being brutal, you know, and that there is no fun in taking someone's life away and you can pin your freshly suffocated butterflies, yeah, and all that. So that's basically the song about it. Um, and this was made as some certain joke. And then I sent this music to Matt, that I also met at Red Rebel Music Academy, by the way, Radio Slave. He, he had the only lecture, you know, out of all lectures. I was a very good student. Uh, uh, I wouldn't miss any. But his was too much for me. I was one of the last lectures uh, in, you know, in the academy. And I haven't really seen the city much. So we decided with my, my, like my girlfriends, we decided just to go and just to have a little walk in the city. And I personally introduced myself to, to Matt and said, I, I apologize, but 
I cannot. I know I know you very well. I'm following your label. You're an amazing producer. You have a great taste in music. But I have to miss your uh, your lecture. But somehow this uh, I gave him um we kept in contact again in touch. He liked um what I was doing on as Damila Ayer because after leaving the band I didn't really want anyone to know that I'm making music. So I created this uh, MySpace account and all my nights you know, I would just smoke cigarettes, uh, drink teas, eating lots of chocolate, and spending all my nights trying this, you know, what I can do. I was absolutely amazed that I, I don't need a band, I don't need anyone to make music. But actually something goes out of this system that I made myself. It was incredible. You know, this first th three or four months, I was not sleeping, I was like, um, you know, um, insomniac. insomniac with big eyes, you know, completely like uh, crazy looking um, and just spending all my free time just doing that, you know. And Matt uh, checked my uh, MySpace, he said, hey, it's cool, it's nice. And then there was some, uh, some maybe half a year passed after I already released music on Underground Quality, also around the same time with Jesset, and it was completely different music, more like house. And one time he's like, oh, I actually really like this song. And the next thing I remember, again, that was, I think, something, uh, some kind of a party. I think it also had something to do with, with, with Red Bull Music Academy. And Matt was playing there. And I was Barcelona, Sonar Festival that I would go every year, you know, like, I would be there just and I would be just absorbing everything I would see, listen to everything I could. You know, this uh, hungry Siberian would be again awakening me. Like I would just absorb everything that I see, not only music, but just everything. And I remember that very well. I went to hear Matt playing in the club. And I'm just dancing, having a good time with a friend of mine. And then I'm there's something itching my ear. I'm like, I know this song. I know this bass line. It's like really amazing bass line. Like serious, like some musician made it or something. And then like the, now another mo minute passes and I hear my voice. And then another minute, and I understand that Matt is actually playing and I'm like, <sighs> like, and people are like dancing to it. I look around and I see people dancing to my music in the, club in Barcelona during the sonar, it sounds actually good. And the friend, he was like, you know, how did you make that bass line? Actually, it sounds so good. And I couldn't believe it. I was, that was, that was one of the most, uh, I don't know, that was the most amazing moments in my life probably. Sure. That I could never erase, you know, this understanding that someone actually does play your music and actually someone does like your music. And you're not even like, I don't know, some super experienced producer, but it's happening, you know? And I didn't even plan that, to be very honest with you. I was making music for my, my, on my own. I was songwriting before for many years and co co like cooperating on music and writing music with other people. But I would never, that, the first time that actually I started doing it on my own was just basically 2000. Eight, maybe. So that was very short. Let's listen to something that you made then, that you enjoyed. Uh, this is a track called Ghetto Kravitz. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> this is like a, one of the songs, like uh, if I ever listen to what other people tell me, th that would be this kind of... And it's the corner store, this like stone. Some people was just like, "Whoa, yeah, that's a good song." The other people were like, "That's why I chose it. It's a good song." Yeah, it's like I could get another angle. I actually made the song in 20 minutes. Oh, this was the fastest. No, actually not the fastest. And now you're just showing off. No, I'm not showing off. I just only took. No, no, no. I'm not showing off. How could you think so? Um, this is. Um, I normally do it on stage normally, but uh, actually the shortest song I ever did was this one. Um, yeah, this one, uh, because it just uh, it was a live recording, mm. so 
with no editing at all. Mm. So that was pretty much the, f the fastest. But that was also one of it. And also again, <laughs> I was working on the remix. Um, yeah, actually, I never told this, but uh, I was working on the remix and uh, I was working, working, and like again, you know, I was wanting, I had a plan. I had a plan to make a great remix. And a, an idea of arrangement and everything. And then, as soon as I, w I wanted my brain to rest a little bit and just to play around for fun without any pressure, I was just like, you know, jamming, da -da -da, put it on a. Uh, a controller, and then I was like, hmm, oh, nice, nice, another nice. So, well, some of the drums are, were taken from this remix package, I have to say. Um, but I, of course, I, I, I changed them. They don't sound anymore how they were, because every instrument or every element that I'm using, it always goes through my processing. It's Kravitz procession, but which, but because I really like it's, it's absolutely um, particular sounding elements. So yeah, but it it really was like almost like a joke again, just like oh summer has gone. It was like almost uh, autumn. It's gone. Summer's gone. I have come home. Spring again. The philosophical song came out of a joke. You don't strike me as much of a, a joker when it comes to taking, you take your work very seriously, but not yourself too seriously. But I would quite like to know, having gone from, from singing in pop bands, rock bands, experimenting with other producers, and then getting your own equipment and making your own tracks with your own voice, is it very important for you that you have creative control over all your music? Absolutely. That was like the, probably uh, the key moment if, if there was any key moment, that's definitely it. Um, again, Siberian roots or having everything under control or let's say um, your way. Um, maybe since I left the band, that was actually a really good moment. Um, I, I realized that working with other people and collaborating is a different thing. Uh, the creative process of sharing something with others um, means that everything you do <clears throat> is also looked after and processed from somebody's eyes and ears and perception. We can talk about it also in terms of my um, performances as a DJ and what I really think about it, how it works. Yeah. So I, I find it very interesting. But... Um, and it is, it can uh, really trigger uh, some interesting things in creative work, but it also can affect the work not in the right way. So I always I was aware about it, working in, with uh, many people my, for my like you know whole life. Um, in first in the band and also working in the hospital, it was always like collectives. You know, you would need to take other people's opinions and other people's lives in consideration. But nothing really gives you more free freedom um, and a right creative flow if you actually work on your own. And um, that's what I've actually been doing since the very start, uh, when I started making my music and Everything and uh, I just I never really I never really um, I like advice, especially from people that I respect or I looked after. Um, from my parents, I like opinions. I can discuss something. I could think about it, but I don't feel comfortable when someone is telling me what to do or. Um, adjusting his own, you know, um, vision of me um, to what I'm doing, you know, or having some plan how you should evolve as an artist or as a musician. This all sounds very strange to me. Some people can work with other people and some people are str like, you know, they're only artists, they only can create music and they want to be locked in that space 
without being interrupted. So they give other people um, permission and other people like, this right to coordinate their life the way they want. I never felt comfortable doing that. I wanted everything to be how I wanted because it's my music. That's the most um, precious thing I have, you know. And you, I, I could be sometimes um, this and that. I could create my own like artistic image, how I want, play with it sometimes, enjoy seeing how people react on it. But I can never be not sincere with what I'm doing with music. Music is something that is like a friend to me, you know? It's like, you don't, you don't, you don't cheat on your friend. And um, that's what always accepts me who I am. That is where I'm free 100%. So I treat the, everything I do in the same way. And I also have a little uh, feel like, apart from the joy that this whole process gives me, I also feel a little responsibility when I play music or when I perform it, when I make it. Because um, it, it doesn't feel right to do something that you don't feel like when it comes to music. It, other things probably, I don't know, but not with that. This has to really go through your own radar, through your own filters of quality, of taste, you know? And I learned from a very early age how is this to actually to do what you really feel like doing, no matter what, because people from a very um, early uh, times of my, let's say, career or path, that time it wasn't really a career, it was more like a hobby, even though I made some little money with that too. But people would always tend to tell me that I don't play the music that people like. Or like, nobody mixes like this. Like, look at that. How do you mix? Who ever like, taught you to do, 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 do that? Don't you know how to make a good mix? And I know that there is not such term as, as, a, as, a, as some kind of a right or incorrect mix. There's only like probably matched beat, but that's pretty much it. There's so much more ways, at least six to my memory, that you can mix records six, five, six different um, styles of mixing. Uh, like if you mix, uh, I don't know, um, dance money record with another dance money record or some 80s stuff, as it crackly and uh, fragile, that would be one mix. If you mix disco music, that would be a completely different mix. If you mix funk music, it's a completely different thing too. And if you be if, like mix more like progressive trancey sounds, probably you could do it long, you know. And if you mix contemporary music, it's a completely different thing. It's also so much uh, having to do something with sonics, with sound systems, with all the equipment, la la la. And um, but no matter what I did, there was always this weird, uh, you know, tension. Like, why you do it this way and not how how it should be? as if there was something that should be. And I never had that in my system, that something is there because it should be. You know? There's so, that you, the artist is there to create, create new ways of expression, or at least his own ways of expression, which is absolutely new, because everyone is unique. And um, so this is probably the most secure way of doing things. If you just do what you really like and listen to uh, everything, that, uh, like to your own signal, which is uh, very difficult, I have to say. There's so much distractions. There's so many uh, ways, uh, situations where you could just like sleep through the, you know, from the path. But when whenever it happened with me, I I would shortly be reminded that I slept. And I, I learned to, to read the signs when that happened. I learned to, um, to see and feel and recognize this state of mind that would signalize that something that I'm doing 
is a little further from what I should be doing, you know? And this is a very particular feeling. <clears throat> uh, so, then later when I would become more, um, I don't know, well-known, then there would be other situations of people with, you shouldn't behave this way, or you shouldn't do that and this. And I was like, why? I don't understand. Are, are, we, are we in the bank? Or are we in some certain, I don't know, governmental uh, building doing something very important? It has to do a lot with some numbers and exact facts or something? No, so why everything has to be the same, you know? Why everything has to be following some rule? But I never mixed rules with education. Education is something else, you know. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, any, nobody needs to learn some stuff. How it, I, st I truly believe that real avant-garde artists, um, experimental artists or painters, they definitely know how to, to draw an image of the human being pretty well. Because um, I, re I, re I understand and I feel very good. And I, I think I also see it visually, in the painting, for example, that avant-garde comes as a form of certain reduction. You know, so you know a lot of things, you have a lot of experience. And then, just because you feel like it, you're just reducing and doing minimalism or abstract thing, painting. But I totally see that the person definitely knows how to draw. He has a school, he has a, you know, he has a lot of practice, 10,000 10, hours of practice. So I hope we don't, we don't mix these two different things of just being doing something on your own and having your own signature sound or the way of behaving or, I don't know, being absolutely signature artist or something, authentic, authentic artist, from doing something just because you, you, you don't know how. This is a little different. When you don't know how, you need to learn how. But when you learn, and then you decided to express yourself, finally, the way you want it. And sometimes it doesn't quickly, you, you find uh, support with that. That's totally fine. It takes time sometimes. Do you feel that the signal you've put out into the world is the one that matters the most to you? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think that's the most healthy state of mind that I could think of. The only, um, like, when you do something that you really want and that excites you, regardless of the amount of hard work that you need to do to, 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 to have this joy and have this, you know, um, possibility to do whatever what you want. You know, I've worked a lot to be able to do what I am doing now. It it was a very long path, yeah. But on every stage of this path, there there was always a choice. There was always a choice. There were always these little pitfalls, always these devilish situations where you could probably do something. I, I, but I, I was lucky. I, I was able to, to listen to, to this voice. And um, if I looked backwards, backwards, yeah. If I look back, um, I totally understand why I was doing certain things. And I am pretty much proud of everything I've done in, in a good way. I mean, not in this um, arrogant way of saying it or something, but yeah, I'm, I, th I think I'm blessed and happy and very thankful um, that I, I, w I, I was able to stay um, who I, I was and uh, to evolve as a, as, a, as a human being, as a personality and as an artist. And I think it's, I feel like it's only the beginning of this process. I'm only starting to learn things, you know? And um, speaking about it, um, I actually feel very lucky. 
that I was able to do so, for sure. Let's get into some records. We spoke a little bit earlier about the sound of acid, and I'd like to play a record that's sitting on that turntable right now. Um, you want this one, right? Well, it sounds good. There's a, there's a lot you could choose, but we have that one all ready to go for you. Okay. I Can I suggest something very quickly? Of, you're the DJ, Nina. You, <laughs> so, you pick um, a record. Since we're talking about acid, if we're talking about acid, um, okay, acid is like the um, essential, the key element of my sonic vision, okay? This is like something that went uh, for the left ear to inside of me, kind of infiltrated my bloodstream, and the traces of this element uh, never leaving me, you know? They're always in my blood, uh, like uh, every day, every morning, whatever. This is just my, my favorite thing in electronic music. This acidism, yeah, acidic elements in music or acid as, not even as a genre, but as, as a thing, as a, as an element, yeah? So, and I spent a lot of time learning, uh, collecting, uh, listening, dancing, uh, making, Mm, this sort of music. And I realized that acid is a vast um, term um, and it is such a large amount of records that you could uh, listen if, you, if you're interested in, in acid music. And they will all belong to different eras, um, they would belong to different countries, they would uh, probably be different BPM, different vibe, um, but they will still, and then sometimes they will even be lacking the main um, baseline that everybody is um, um, prepared to, to hear, you know? Because sometimes acidic music and acid music can have absolutely no baseline, but I still believe it's acid music. And uh, this journey uh, of investigating a little bit more about this genre, I started like on that radio show when I was a teenager, and it still continues, goes on every day. I learned some new records and some new musicians, and this is pretty incredible. And at the time when you think, okay, now I definitely know most of the things, and that's the moment when another uh, artist or another label pops up and then you realize that there's a whole new chapter opens up for you and so much and that makes me very happy because I know that it's endless it's never gonna end it's gonna be like the whole life and when I'm gonna be a pensioner um, like uh, you know reading books and probably would be watching TV in between of all that I will be probably still digging for records and writing a book about acid maybe so now we are um, we're listening to just one of it, one example of uh, acidism in music. It's um, coming from Midwest, I think. Um, it's uh, Woody McBride, DJ ESP, one of my favorite, and I think one of the most important men for the genre. I think it's his track, because there's also yeah, it's also a skull, but it doesn't matter because it's just an amazing record. It's really rough, and um, some people don't really like that such music, but I'm not one of them. I definitely love this roughness, this uh, realness, and um, the speed and the expression. For many people, you know, which actually was really annoying to me for many years, like, for, for many people that like acid, they're like really uh, limiting themselves with only Chicago traditional sound, you know. They don't want to recognize anything else. They think that it is American music, which I truly believe it is not only American music. It's Why do you believe it's not only American music? <laughs> We're talking about acid actually for the last 10 minutes. So, um, and I'm just gonna play you one last track to just tell you that um, for example, this isn't a classic acid track because it doesn't have an acid line in it. 
But this is an absolutely magical record, and if someone follow, ever like heard of me or whatever, maybe um, you saw me talking or playing this track, which is a completely magical work <clears throat> of um, one guy from um, Un United Kingdom, and this is probably the only uh, musician that I never made uh, d available for digital downloads on my label. This is a record on Trip. And this is a very rare record that uh, got to me. It's not that I found it. It's actually the record seems like found me a little bit. It was like this mystical feel around it. Um, I was just playing some record on my boiler room and that then the friend of this musician that didn't put out any music for like 20 something years heard me doing that, sent me some box with records. Then I moved houses, opened the box half a year, a year later, like played the record, I was like, wow, blown away. I would start playing it everywhere. And that was this same producer that made this record that I played in Boiler Room, which is a very rare, fantastic uh, record on Submerge. Um, not Submerge, what am, I, what am I saying? Some other name with Sub, it doesn't matter. So basically, uh, this is a track uh, which doesn't have an acid line, but I truly believe it's an acid track. You can do whatever you want with me, but like it, the feel of it, like the, the the spirit is definitely coming from mm, from there for sure. Nope. Uh, oh yeah. You know, like every time I hear this track, I don't know how many play, how many times I played it. It's just so good. It's just I don't know. Some people hate it. Probably I don't mind. I love it. It's What's so it good. called? It's called Barco Population, and um, on this record it's called Untitled, but um, on the original pressing it, was, it had a different name, but it um, doesn't matter. Yeah. And listen to that on Spotify <laughs> and save this time. <laughs> I should have I should have known if you bought a bag of records we yeah, were going to have a little but session. You know the, the the thing is that I would probably play uh, six more records but we don't have time I know I know. So there will be next thing will be Spiral Tribe there will be Sehko you know from uh, Finland and there will be completely different range of acid music all different geography different timing different texture of it with acid line without acid line then we'll, of course, go to Belgium and even deeper in the Holland forests. <laughs> forests of Holland, yeah, sounds like a joke because we all know that there aren't forests in Holland. But uh, there are some great clubs and amazing studios where people actually um, made something like Underground Resistance, but in Holland, like Unit Mobius and um, Bunker Records, and there's like a whole bunch of Frankfurt scene, you know, that I was doing... Mark Akaridban, uh, I don't know, this, this record, his label, you know, and like uh, 1,000, 1 million amazing works he did. There's like such a wide range of, of assets in the world and um, every little family, every little hood would represent some certain specific sounding of that. And that would happen for the course of um, 30 something years now. Believe it or not. And this is what I love truly and fully, and I don't think it will ever end. And when, even if I, maybe when I do a second album, that was, this song was from my first one, but if I ever make a new one, I would probably also use something at Cedic, and even if it will be like the most pop record, who knows, I would also probably play with that too, or at least with that feeling, you know, with that feeling of constant, mystery and no, not knowing what's going to happen next. So what's going to happen next is we're going to talk about your label, how this acid sound feeds into your work, because I feel that you really came into being as a producer and a DJ and a creative person. It seemed to all mesh together when Trip 
your label really started to take off. Tell me about the sounds that are on this label and where you find them from, because I know that you're very close to the country of Iceland. Um, uh, I think uh, trip is um, one of the most important thing uh, that I've done as a human being, for sure. It brought me so much play, uh, joy and excitement. And uh, firstly, because I, I managed to work with fantastic, talented, uh, inspiring people. Um, secondly, because through the label, I was able artic to articulate my musical message, you know, at what I was... <laughs> Hello. Wow. <laughs> How are you? Como <laughs> estai? <laughs> That's my teacher. Sorry. I, he, um, Marco was my teacher. Yeah. Hi, Marco Passerani. <laughs> Ciao. Marco, I have, a, I have a CD. I have a CD. The, you remember the days? I was, it's 2006. I made a CD. At that time, I was really into uh, um, um, Italian electronica and Italo disco and electro disco and I was mixing it with classic disco. It was another thing with acid, of course, yeah, with Armando. And uh, Marco's project, Pina People, was actually also part of it. And then Alexander Probotnik also, I think Italian, right? It was awesome. Yeah, and also you have a beautiful, beautiful t-shirt. It's a very good record. Right. Yeah, pick up so, under resistance. Um, basically, um, through the label, um, I was able to configure and to articulate my, what I think about music. How do I ident identify texture of it? What is it that I'm playing? And I was trying to put all these little segments and elements of what I was doing from the very beginning, from when I was playing funk records and then disco, and then um, was completely into intergalactic FM, you know, probably Marco also knows this very well. Um, some horror soundtracks, Italian 70s, um, obscure, uh, easy listening and soundtrack music. Um, this all was kind of found its continuation in what I've done with Trip. At the same time, I was recording DJ Kicks, where I had to exercise my uh, possibilities, uh, my abilities as a DJ. So that was like a trigger point, trigger thing for me to start, you know, thinking about what I was actually trying to say for all these years as a, as a DJ, because it wasn't really clear that time. <clears throat> I would sometimes play some dance money, then I would do some disco stuff, and it kind of, it had to be, you know, there was, there was supposed to be some meeting point for all that. Because for me, no matter what I did, it all had some certain echo. It was e echoing through the, uh, all the chapters of my interest as a musical fan. Because I don't, I still, when I talk about it, I'm talking about it from a position of a musical fan, like you probably are. I think it's one of the most incredible thing to actually be excited about what you hear and to discover new music and to keep in re-inspiring sometimes or rediscovering the same music that you were, were, you know, you probably didn't play for some time. And Trip was definitely a music lover um, enterprise, you know. This was just something to share like on, in a home party, music with other people. Yes, I created some concept, of course. I, I wanted it to be also having some certain visual element because I... It came to you in a dream, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was like a dream. It was a horror dream after probably listening to some acid from IF. I had a dream. I have an acidic dream. So um, this, is, this was like a dream about an octopus, deviant octopus that devoured everyone inside in just a second and didn't even remember what happened with him, you know. It was like happened over a second. And then mm, while I was collecting music for my DJ kicks, I was just like, hmm. I started also somehow, absolutely automatically, uh, asking people for some music, explaining them that I'm just about to start a label and that um, I'm, I'm, it's not going to be like this usual way of releasing music, but I'm going to 
take your music and some other people's music from different times and decades. There will be new music, there will be old music. Um, as if some one person made it as an album. So the first album contained some Steve Stoll, Terence Dixon, my own production, um, Bjarke stuff. Um, and I tried to make it sound as if it was an album made by somebody. Yeah? Even though it wasn't. And even though it was a very weird idea, even when I tried to, to present this idea to press or something, it was very hard to explain. You know, what, do, what do you mean? Like, what kind of album? So yeah, I just wanted to make, to at least dream or uh, envision for myself that I'm just this one musician and I'm making an album out of tracks that, like in Time Machine, have no age, have no date of release. They're just floating in some certain sphere, you know, echoing through each other. And then finally they land and meet on this record. That you, by the way, there are two records, so you can play, just have two turntables, play two records, you know, and they will be perfectly mixing and there will be like a countless, um, infinite loop. You could play the only those two records in this position, in that position. And um, so then I just absolutely, I don't know why it happened, but I met this guy on, 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 online and he drew this picture about the octopus and that's how the label started. And this concept, it would continue for a few releases and I would like the, probably the, uh, the most important thing about the label, I think. Even though I do sometimes 12 inches or EPs. And also it's very interesting to me to put legendary musicians with some new talents, you know, because the music they make is, I, for me, sonically, it has a very um, deep connection. And I, I don't put records just because I like them, that's it, but I, I also wait until the whole collage, you know, will be finished by itself, that when the right record would, would be found, you know? And until that happens, I don't release music. I don't have a schedule. I have a constant problem with people that like to tell me what to do, of course. It's like a, a constant struggle. They're like, Nina, you need to have um, a record plan. You need to sell more music, you need to release more music, you know, you need to keep the label running. And I understand it, it's, it's important, but I can't do that unless I feel this is the right moment. And I don't have any logical explanation for, for this right moment. But unless I feel the right moment, when it comes, I'm like, yeah, we're doing that. And then I'm sending and then I'm trying to, and I'm annoying everybody by spitting, let's do it quickly, let's do it quickly. I said, yeah, but we've been waiting for you like half a year. You, you were not ready, now you're speeding us up. And I'm like, it doesn't matter, the idea is there, let's do it. You know, I was watching too much uh, documentaries about James Brown, probably was a bad influence without knowing it, because he was also calling his musicians, you know, during the night, rushing them up. Yeah, we have, we have a song, come, we're gonna do it. Or Stevie Wonder, I think, no, it's, it was James Brown, for sure. Why don't we listen to something that you made from the Deviant Octopus, because from the music that we've been listening to of your own so far, it's very much changed because of your journey on trip. I don't think so. Do you I not? Don't think, no, no, no. I, for me, totally, I can tell you that for 100%. I don't think that this actually changed because um, for me, music doesn't exist in the frame of BPM or um, instruments that it's made of. It doesn't matter, or even the genre. It doesn't exist for me. You know, when it, it didn't exist for me in 2006, for example, when I made that CD, you know, and I was mixing Chic from 70s, disco band, you know, with, uh, with Armando from Chicago, you know, acid music. Because I, for me, the, di the di distance in between uh, Donna Summer, you know, uh, to uh, Detroit Techno, uh, Italo Disco, um, EBM, it's, it doesn't, it's very short. It all, there will not be Detroit Techno without Italian music, there will not be Italian music without Belgian music, there will not be Belgian music without this and that. Everything is connected. Like everything we do in this world, the musical world is connected. 
and everything is being influenced by something. So I don't see the point uh, of looking at music in this way, you know? For me, it's only just, I, I feel it, it's my texture, it's my, ma it's my mood, it's my vibe, let's do it. So for me, in my, in my mind, everything is connected, absolutely. And I don't think I've changed a, a dime, you know, really. I think in that sense, I all, all my music, regardless of the genre or of, of the BPM, sounds a little unfinished, unpolished, you know, perfectly, perfect for mixing because, um, I didn't say easy for mixing though, it's very difficult to mix normally, but it is perfect for mixing because it's a little, little bit unfinished and empty kind of, so when you mix it with something else, it creates a very cool full layer, while if you're mixing totally finished and perfectly produced music, then it feels a little more too full, you know, when you mix it. So, because I like this kind of vibe in music in general, as if it was made as some certain mistake or, I don't know, um, just like you were running out of the house and then suddenly phone rang and you were like, oh, oh, and then you, if, oh, and then you saw the synthesizer and then you, the microphone was on and then you just made something just like that. I like the music that is made without an intention, and I like the music that was not made um, with a plan. I love it, and I could hear it immediately. Like, in two seconds, you could feel it, that the person who was making the music didn't really know what, he was, who's gonna, what, it, what he's gonna get in the end of this adventure. Adventurous music, you know, that's probably like liquid space. <laughs> Something that is floating and floating absolutely effortlessly and we are there just to observe and enjoy and sometimes coordinated or even being part of this beautiful creative process. But pretty much that's it. And I have to say, the only thing that, um, that probably, I hope people understand me correctly now, of course, I respect and um, um, love eternally uh, the production of from the 70s or 60s or even 80s, where there will be 50, 60 people working on the album, knowing exactly what to do. But this is something completely different. This is something that people do because they, they are playing real instruments, they are just one person is responsible for, for something on the record, you know? And even that time, even there is a producer like telling everybody what to do, even that time, there is always this element of, of a miracle, you know, of magic, that only appears when people are enjoying, they're relaxed, you know, they are not doing under any agenda rather the only agenda is just to finish the record that's it but this is, makes it a big difference the music that is absolutely effortlessly made as a act of divine something you know or the music that was made with a certain plan to match some expectations to fill a gap and to fi to actually to be made to f to make um, to make it fit to a certain environment where it will be performed. Yeah, because it's also a very interesting topic. I would love to listen to something that you made on trip right now. Could you do me the honours and put on the B1 of this? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, madame. Uh, I also want to listen to this. I know you, you got very excited going through all those records, but I really want everyone to sink into this and listen to this one in full because I want to talk about how it was made. But that means that we cannot speak about David Byrne, mm, you know, uh, ideas about music. We cannot speak about uh, the audience and the music that doesn't exist without a listener. There are so many different topics I wanted to discuss and it will all be, you know, devoured by my own tune. Sounds little... Selfish, but, <laughs> you know. The B1, please. B1, where is B1? This is a track called Improve, Improve. and it was released in 2014? Yep, exactly. I recorded uh, the sound of it, so funny. If you hear, I, I was uh, waiting for the driver in, um, airport in Belgium 
and uh, I recorded some, I love recording things, by the way, um, without people knowing that I'm recording them. Because as soon as they know that they're recorded, they change. Like when I play live, for example, if I know I'm recorded, I'm the worst DJ ever. Like, I cannot, I don't know, I'm just not myself. But if I'm recorded without being told that I'm recorded, that's something different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I was sitting at the airport and the, the driver was late and I recorded some atmosphere, just everything that was happening in the room, in the cafe. And then I already recorded the song, everything, almost like sent it to mastering. And then I was like, what is that melody that I actually hear on the back? And I realized, I think it's a Lady Gaga song. I think so. Like, but I'm not so sure. Like, if you hear, tell me if it's this one or not. I think it is. But uh, I'm not so sure, because I don't remember what was it. But something on the radio. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you. So that was uh, improve about the insecurities that complete us to grow. That to me sounds like a record made by someone that understands how a club moves and feels and the pace changes and another element comes in and it all just like flows together. Do you feel that as you've become a more well-known DJ, a more adventurous DJ, someone that indulges in their tastes, regardless of what room they're playing to, that it's impacted how you make your own music? Mm, definitely, definitely. I think um, this was all the part of a um, general process of growing up, of um, evolving as an artist, as a human being, because I don't see um, any possibility to um, to disconnect the human being uh, from the art he makes to some certain extent. Even though I I agree that there is a point and there is a way of creating some image, artistical image, you know, and that's a big talent if you can do that. <clears throat> but still, I think. Uh, inspiration and um, true mastery and uh, this talent, talented energy, I would say. Yeah, it comes from experience, um, from um, um, everyday work. And I'm not talking about uh, everyday work of collecting records or practicing, you know, communication with an instruments, synthesizers or whatever it is, the trumpet. I'm talking about everyday work as a, as a person, as a human being. Because I think the real artist, the true artist, is someone who is noticing a lot, he's observing. And anything can be an inspiration, absolutely anything. Like a person you meet, or a little thought that you had having your morning coffee somewhere in a new city, or just some struggles or happy moments. Even though I don't, unfortunately, I haven't learned yet to um, to get my inspiration, to be able to dig, to get kind of to get it in the time I wanted from happy moments. Unfortunately. The, my best uh, works, to my personal opinion, and my most creative phases, uh, you know, are growing on rather less happy moments. You know, where I'm questioning something, where I'm struggling, or I'm going through a very weird personal phase or something like that. It could be anything, any sort of struggle, but it always has an impact on the music that I'm making. Definitely. And you, I could totally hear it. I could totally hear it. But this long introduction was to actually answer your question. Because um, by performing in so many different cities, in so many different places, by um, engaging in so many conversations and um, you know, eye-to-eye -eye moments, even this situation right now, it would probably 
and it is impacting the music that we hear now together. It is not the same song that you would hear somewhere else. And it is not the same song that it was when I was actually creating it. Because I believe there is no music without a listener. And there is no subject without uh, object, you know. <laughs> and there is no object without subject. Subjective, objective. There are people in the room, we are listening to the music, and you are participating in the process of perception, of musical perception. You are creating a new meaning around something. And you are adding your own to this piece, musical piece in this particular moment. So every time I perform, I can never have the same show and I can never have the same performance for several reasons. And one of the most important reasons is that every crowd is different and even if you are observed by a couple of people, your music is going through their system of perception. And it exists in this particular scenario that would never be able to be repeated again. And I, the moment I realized that, which was probably, I, I always knew it somewhere, you know, so somewhere deep inside of me, but I never thought about it. And now um, that I thought about it and I read some books that were like very thought provoking, and I realized that other musicians also noticed that, you know, that basically, um, based on where the music is performed, by who it is performed by, and most importantly, by who it is being uh, perceived and listened, you know? The whole experience changes. And if, you, if there is nobody in the room, or if there is no, no ears that are able to listen to this particular track, there isn't a track. It doesn't exist. And the other thing is like, the other interesting moment is that um, when I play mostly um, music by other people, sometimes my, my own music, of course, but I'm a DJ, so I'm playing lots of different records uh, that were made in the different times of lives and decades by completely different people with their own worlds, with their own artistic uh, selves, you know? And, but I reinterpret every time the idea that they had when they actually recorded this, a particular song. I take the something that they made with a certain intention there in the studio or at home. But, but by, by playing it, I'm, you know, I'm putting it through my own system of my own emotional world. So I enrich this with a completely different sense, the completely different essence. And sometimes I, I truly believe that the idea or the mood or emotion that an artist or a musician had while recording a certain composition could probably be changed by, uh, by the emotional uh, take of the person who actually performs the song. Because I'm, when I'm putting this, I'm not really playing records to make a mix. It's much more than that, yeah? I'm performing a song, I'm putting it through my system I'm creating my own artistic sonic world at this moment for a certain amount of people. And depending on what kind of people I see in front of me or feel sometimes, if, it, if it's dark, I, always, I still feel who is in front of me without even looking there. The whole experience and in the music in particular will have a different meaning. I truly believe so. So yes, this all changed me a lot. I started noticing these things. And I started also noticing that there's a lot that I can do and there's a lot I, that, I, that I can change uh, in front of large crowds um, just by being not focused or being sad or being arrogant or being absolutely uh, the opposite. You know, when the ego level is a little too low and you cannot be a commander, you know, because you need to be a leader when you're Performing, a performer is a leader. He needs to respect the crowd. The crowd needs to feel appreciated and respected. But the first 10 or 15 minutes is there for you to earn 
respect and, and to keep the focus, the attention of the crowd, so they can trust you enough to go on on the journey for the rest of the set or performance. And this is a really tricky moment, and no matter how experienced and no matter how popular the artist is, in front of how many um, crowds of this amount or that amount you ever performed, this experience will always feel very new. And there's no guarantee what kind of result you will have in the end. Sometimes you just, I don't know, sometimes I feel so blocked. You know, I want, I want to be, I want to do a great job and I'm trying to do so, but something is wrong. You know, and you, I don't know what is wrong. The technical side is perfect, amazing people in front of you, full dance floor, but something is just not, you know, not going through and it, you could physically feel it. I could physically feel the, 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 the moment where I have an ultimate experience when 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 the state of flow is perfect yeah when um when everything is and the, and it's incredible it never you know it never ceases to amaze me people say yeah what can you really feel on a big festival where you you performing in front of let's say 20 10000 people you just stay stand there like in some far away remote point Nobody can really see you, just a dot, playing some music. Like, I mean, come on. The small club is so much better, because you have 300 people totally like in you. You can see, you can even shake a hand if you want. But no, I disagree. I learned that people are extremely sens sensible and sensitive to every emotion a performer and the artist has. The slight correlation of this emotion has a tremendous effect. I don't know how this works. I don't know how this works. It's, it's, it's still like a miracle to me. How this amount of people could catch this vibe so easily, just by the way you play, or by, like, by, by the way how you operate with everything, how you move. I could see it totally. Like when I'm not comfortable, people know it. They know it. And I... I love the, every crowd for this honesty, <laughs> you know? There's, there, you cannot cheat the crowd. Sometimes people believe like, um, I mean, what, why? I mean, you know so much and what, what do they really know? Like how, like they just dance without listening. No. People are extremely sensible. They're like, the only comparison I could find to describe this is when you, you come with your son or with your daughter to a museum and you see the most amazing work of art. The kid isn't educated. He doesn't have anything but his eyes, ears, and your hand in his hand. And you can immediately really feel like, does he like it or he doesn't? And then when you see that he likes it, you see like, he likes it, um, you think, why? Like, why he likes it? And why he doesn't like this, but likes this? Still, I, I still didn't really find the answer for that. I, I'm still running in between two concepts. One concept is that every great, like really the truly great music, truly great record, will always reach a big amount of people and will be simple and understandable for majority. And another concept, which I also agree partly with, is that there is music and there are areas in Sonic World that are not accessible for everybody. And some music will, not, will never be able to be appreciated by majority of people. I also agree with that. But then when I performed and answering your question, if I changed or if it affected me, of course it, it did affect me. But it didn't affect in the way I, in my attitude towards this, this issue, if it's an issue at all. Because I realized that, yeah, I'm in between of two different concepts, but I cannot play 
music that I am not excited about and that doesn't make me, you know, go crazy absolutely when I'm playing it. And what if I don't want, if I don't have a new music? That's why I never prepare sets. So I want to have this fresh moment when I don't know how it will sound in the end. It's risky, yeah, but if it does work, it, it's so good, you know, that you, you've mixed two records that you haven't tried before, and then you're like, oh, yeah, and, and it gives you such so much pleasure and so much joy, and infiltrates the entire performance, the rest of it, with, with raw, full energy, and you cannot buy anywhere else, you know, this excitement, this first thing, this first take, like you meet someone, or fell in, feel, fell in love, or something. And I kind of realized, after doing this, after trying many things, and after thinking about it, that yes, I'm in between of these two concepts, but I also know that people are there, as weird as it may sound, are not ready for the music. Because music, sadly, or maybe it's just, I should take it as a fact, it's just a tool to transmit someone else's emotions and to be able to connect with emotions of a different person through sonic world, through sonic alphabet, let's say, if you look at it like that. So following that concept, you can play the best records um, in the most, let's say, ill, non-energetic way, be being absolutely unable to connect with anybody through it, through the music. Music doesn't, doesn't find its listener or something like that. Then it doesn't matter what kind of music you play. And the same happens when um, you play, let's say, people play some simple music. Easy to mix, easy to find, easy to perceive. And people are absolutely happy because the person knows how to reach this, how to, to trigger this point of connection. And in the end of the day, every artist um, wants to be appreciated. And not in terms of uh, this kind of feedback. I'm not talking about the feedback, like, oh yeah, you're so great, you said it was so nice today. Oh my God, you're my favorite DJ, absolute favorite. This is not what you, we probably won't secretly think, but it's not really important. What you really crave for is that ultimate connection, this friendship, this absolutely intimate emotion that appears on the dance floor or in the room. And when this is the primarily, primarily like important point that you try to reach artistically, then the music unfortunately comes on the second, uh, you know, place because at the end of the day you need to know how to engage something with it no matter what kind of music it is so when I see that people know masterfully know how to do that regardless of what they play or what they make as musicians I truly respect that because it it is a it is a very very big skill to be able to get into this contact with people that sometimes seems to be very um, easy to establish, but by having so many um, weird gigs, and sometimes when I'm fully prepared and I want to make the best show, but I just don't feel like I've, I've reached this moment, I know that it's very important to have this result, you know, this skill. Nina Kravitz, I want to thank you for talking to us today. Thank you very much.